is the second part of the lecture on the adrenal cortical hormones. So this is part two. This is going to um, discuss the glucocorticoids, but also at the end we'll just talk about some, some conditions that may affect both glucocorticoids or mineralocorticoids. So the glucocorticoids, remember, are produced within the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex, the predominant glucocorticoid in humans being cortisol. So we're going to look at the effects of cortisol. Now unlike mineralocorticoids, if you don't produce glucocorticoids, it's not acutely life-threatening, but if you don't treat it, eventually you will die from it. But acutely, lack of mineral corticoids is going to kill you a lot quicker than lack of glucocorticoids. But the lack of glucocorticoids can affect a lot of systems in your body because of its effects on your metabolism. Now, what we're going to look at are the physiologic actions of cortisol. Now, some of it may seem confusing, but I want you to just kind of put this in your mind. The overall purpose of the glucocorticoids on glucose metabolism, hence again the name glucocorticoids, its job is to try to make sure you have enough energy for the point when you have acute stress. Glucocorticoids are predominantly mm -hmm. chronic stress hormones but they're preparing you for times of acute stress. And in this picture here, epi is short for epinephrine. So in times where you're in acute stress mode, when epinephrine levels are be high, it's to make sure you're going to have enough energy for those times of acute stress. So this is what it's going to do. We're going to be looking at the various effects on metabolism. They will affect a number of different tissues. It's going to work again through gene transcription, affecting the activity of particular enzymes. And what it's going to do is first let's look at its effects on fat. Glucocorticoids affect um, enzymes that allow you to break down adipose tissue. So it promotes lipolysis. And here, when you break down adipose tissue, you're going to get fatty acids and glycerol. Now, fatty acids are a very good energy source. So that fatty acids can be used by muscle, can be used by liver, a number of different tissues for energy. Well, the glycerol backbone for the triglycerides that are found in adipose tissue can be transported to the liver and serve as a carbon source to make glucose as well as amino acids that are released when muscle is broken down. So what glucocorticoids also do is it stimulates the breakdown of muscle protein. So it stimulates protein degradation. When you break down protein, you're going to get amino acids. The glucogenic amino acids can be used as, long, as well as glycerol as carbon sources to making glucose and glucocorticoids will stimulate the um, activity and synthesis of enzymes that are involved in gluconeogenesis. So, so far the glucocorticoids will promote gluconeogenesis, protein degradation, and lipolysis. It also promotes the formation of glycogen from the glucose. So that glucose is going to be stored for a rainy day. So that glucose is going to be available in times of acute stress. So if you break down glycogen, you're going to get some glucose. So overall you're seeing the cortisol allowing us to break down muscle protein, break down adipose tissue, make glucose, the gluconeogenesis by the liver, and also form glycogen to store it for times of acute stress. These fatty acids will be used as energy sources for muscle, but also that liver. The formation of glucose is very energetically costly. So the liver is going to use those fatty acids as an energy source so it can make the glucose as well as make glycogen. So these are the physiologic actions of cortisol on glucose metabolism.
but glucocorticoids also have very well documented effects on other things in your body. They're very important anti-inflammatory um, agents. So a lot of people, if they've had like a skin rash, um, they've gone to the, 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 the pharmacy and got some topical cream to put on it and they were, they were synthetic glucocorticoids. They're anti-inflammatory. They also depress the immune system. So um, they're used in patients who are having had transplant, uh, so to help re prevent rejection of transplants because it depresses the immune response. It is used by people who have rheumatoid arthritis, other diseases that are result in a lot of inflammation. Asthmatics are take synthetic glucocorticoids, and these are just some of the names of synthetic glucocorticoids you may have heard of: dexamethasone, prednisone, cortisone, methylprednisone. They're used in the treatment of a number of conditions. But this is something I need you need to think about. It does affect obviously has important effects on glucose metabolism and but it has these anti-inflammatory effects and effects on the immune system so if you've got too much cortisol what could happen if you know what the normal response of these things if you get too much what overall could happen so things like, and I have them listed in your notes, and we're going to go over again. I'm going to give you a specific example condition where you see this, but it can, I'll go back to this picture so you can kind of see it. Since it promotes protein degradation, it can lead to muscle wasting um, because of its effects on glucose metabolism. It can result in higher levels of glucose and be more of a type 2 diabetes. Because of its effects on the immune system, it can impair um, wound healing um, or uh, make people more prone to infections because it suppresses that immune system. It also can lead to hypertension. And if I have time, well, I'm going to have time, but I'll discuss how it can affect or cause high blood pressure at the very end of the lecture. But let's first look at what, how is it controlled? How cortisol is the secretion if it's controlled? So cortisol is produced in the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex. Its main stimulus for cortisol production is ACTH. So it is under hormonal stimuli. So ACTH stimulates the production of cortisol by the adrenal cortex. The ACTH, remember, is produced by cells, the corticotropes, in the adenohypophysis, which is controlled by hormone corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH, that's produced by the hypothalamus. So cortisol is con controlled hormonally, but ultimately what stimulates the production of, of the CRH by the hypothalamus? A number of different things. Any sort of stress will result in an increased production of ACTH, which then stimulates the release of cortisol. The cortisol's job is to allow you to deal with stress in any way, shape, or form. It could be a metabolic stress, it could be exercise, infections, hemorrhage, pain, emotions, a whole number of different things can affect this. Okay? Just to show you how quickly or just how little things you think wouldn't be that much can affect ACTH and therefore affect cortisol production is when I was doing research, I wanted to when I wanted to look at the effects of what I was doing to the animal, I had to make sure or prove to the people I was presenting my papers to that the, 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 the rats weren't stressed because I know cortisol can have effects on some of the body systems that I was looking at. So what I would have to do is I would have to measure, what Isa would be to do is to measure ACTH levels in the animal because ACTH, if it's high, the cortisol levels will be high. But also, you can also measure cortisol levels in the animal. So we had to take blood samples 
during the sacrifice of the animal to confer that what we're seeing was not because of the effects of stress and the effects of cortisol on the animal. The, um, what I do, want to do for just briefly is talk about, before we go over specific um, clinical conditions that affect glucocorticoid production or even mineralocorticoids, I want to mention the adrenal antigens. Earlier I said that the adrenal antigens or the, any of the sex hormones produced by the, the zona fasciculata, or I'm um, sorry, reticularis in the adrenal cortex is very minor. So it's more in the males, it's more involved in fetal development. Females, I had mentioned about its, its effects on pubic and axillary hair. But there are conditions where if you've got some defects in the enzymes in the pathways that are involved in the production of these adrenal androgens, it can result in clinical conditions. Or if you overproduce, um, say, the adrenal androgens, males, they can get premature puberty. But it's very interesting to see it in females because if a female is overproducing adrenal androgens while they're developing, when the, when the child is born, it's going to look like the, the girl is actually a boy because it promotes the production of the external genitalia in the male. So they have what we call ambiguous genitalia. And a condition that can result is that in this is something we call congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now, I'm not going to really discuss this one, but if you're ever interested in looking that up, there's a lot of different defects that encompass this. But the, one that, the ones that are interesting is when you have the females that are born and they kind of look like they're a male, but a really good doctor can see that something's not quite right and they will test that, that um, female very quickly and they can get it under control. So obviously the, the girl's not going to be growing up thinking that it's a boy. And, they'll, and obviously some of the conditions can be a lot worse, can lead to um, derangements in sodium and also potassium balance. So we just ignore this because this is one of the things that can lead to congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But I want to talk about is something called Cushing's. Now there is something called Cushing's disease and Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's disease and Cushing's syndrome have the same signs and symptoms. Where they differentiate between disease and syndrome is the cause of it. So it, with Cushing's, I'm just going to say generically, Cushing's is associated with overproduction of cortisol. Okay, so you have overproduction of cortisol, and it could be because of a adrenal defect or a, a defect within the pituitary. So if you have pituitary Cushing's, this is where a patient overproduces ACTH from the pituitary gland, specifically the adenohypophysis. ACTH stimulates the production of cortisol. So the adrenal is going to do what it normally is told to do. If ACTH is around, it's going to produce cortisol. So with pituitary Cushing's, they call it Cushing's disease. This is a what we refer to as a secondary endocrine disorder if it's Cushing's disease because the defect here in this case is the pituitary. So this is a ACTH dependent Cushing's disease or Cushing's. If it's you have adrenal Cushing's or Cushing's syndrome, the adrenals not functioning properly. So either you got like hyperplasia of the adrenal glands, uh, you could have tumors, um, things like that, or even sometimes tumors outside the adrenal that cause the adrenal gland to overproduce cortisol. It is referred to as a primary endocrine disorder because the adrenal is not properly functioning right. In this case, if you've got Cushing syndrome, ACTH levels will be low in these patients because of classic negative feedback. My cortisol levels are high, it should feed back and say, pituitary, stop producing ACTH. But something is not working right that's still overproducing cortisol. Remember, in Cushing's disease, ACTH and cortisol levels will both be elevated. 
in some very, very, very rare conditions, you may have a problem with the hypothalamus overproducing CRH, which results in Cushing's, and that would re be referred to as more of a tertiary endocrine disorder. But we don't differentiate, we don't say Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome for that. Generally, it's a problem with pituitary or with the adrenal itself. Now, with people with Cushing's, because they overproduce the cortisol, these are some of the things that you're going to see. The arms and legs will be very thin because of the muscle wasting. So it causes muscle wasting. And what you'll notice is they got big bellies. They get what we call centripetal obesity. They have these large bellies. It causes a redistribution of fat. So earlier we said, well, cortisol stimulates lipolysis. Yes. So you break down fat, but whatever fat you don't use, you're going to reform it up. And for some reason, we're not sure how exactly why, it likes to reassemble around the core organs. So it leads to centripetal obesity. They also tend to get what we call moon facies. They get a buffalo hump in the back also. Be, uh, because of its effects on um, the uh, blood glucose, they can have hyperglycemia, which can lead to a type 2 type diabetes. Um, the, they can get increased susceptibility to infections because of cortisol's effects on the immune system. They get stretch marks or striae. And the reason why they get stretch marks is cortisol also tends to degrade elastin and collagen. And, and so the skin becomes very thin and they get more of, I mean, obviously, and also because if you're getting, if you get stretch marks on the belly, if you get, your belly gets too fat too soon, you're going to get stretch marks. But it does lead to um, a lot of easy, easily being bruised because of the degradation of the, the collagen. Um, they have, you notice this guy's face is very red. The reason why his face is really red, besides, it, it, cortisol also, believe it or not, promotes the production of red blood cells. And so um, you'll see kind of the, the face kind of getting very red. Okay, the um, high blood pressure may also be, you may also see high blood pressure with people with Cushing's. The reason why you're going to get the high blood pressure will be the same mechanism as you see with high blood pressure as a result of overproduction of aldosterone. And I'm going to mention to you a little bit kind of the reason why. So it's, it, they will get hypertensive. Again, it's going to be because of a sodium um, too much um, sodium reabsorption, and it leads to hypertension this way. Now, Cushing's, some patients with Cushing's may also look bronzed, like they get, they look like they're tanned. They can get what we call hyperpigmentation. That will only happen if ACTH secretion is increased, so if you've got Cushing's disease. So if ACTH levels are elevated, so it's a secondary endocrine disorder, you can get hyperpigmentation. This is the reason why. ACTH mimics MSH, and MSH is melanocyte stimulating hormone. So it mimics, it has very similar effects as MSH would on pigmentation. So if ACTH levels are high, they're going to look like they're tanned. Now this is going to be something you may see in another condition because of elevated ACTH. So but remember with Cushing's, it, ACTH may be elevated or depressed depending on what the problem is. Is it from the pituitary or the adrenal? Now here, John F. Kennedy Jr. was thought, or not sorry, Jr., that's his son, John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy, was thought to have Addison's disease. And he always said he always was a constant bronze to him. He was constantly tanned. It was thought that he suffered from Addison's disease. And here's a, an individual with Addison's disease. But what they're showing you here is the bronzing of their skin. With Addison's disease, ACTH levels are elevated. So it causes that hyperpigmentation that I had mentioned that you saw with Cushing's disease. 
Why is the ACTH elevated with people with Addison's? Here's the problem. With Addison's disease, the adrenals are failing. They undersecrete or hyposecrete the hormones from the adrenal cortex. So if they undersecrete cortisol, you've got low cortisol levels, ACTH levels will be high because the pituitary is saying, hey, I don't have enough cortisol. I need to produce ACTH so I can produce more cortisol, but to know, you know, it's still not going to work, so somehow the adrenals are not functioning right, but ACTH levels are elevated for people with Addison's disease. The, besides having low cortisol levels, these patients are also under secreting aldosterone, so they're not producing mineralocorticoids. So if you're not producing the, the mineralocorticoids, you're going to get um, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, low blood pressure can lead to shock. A drop in that blood pressure can lead to shock. And that's what usually people with Addison's disease are going to present with in the hospitals because of that lack of mineralocorticoids. They have hypoglycemia because of the lack of cortisol. So remember, cortisol allows you to maintain glucose metabolism, but if they don't make cortisol, they can be hypoglycemic. The um, Addison's disease can be easily treated, well, easy, relatively easily treated, is patients with Addison's disease have to receive lifelong administration of aldosterone as well as cortisol. So they're going to be just given back these hormones that their body is no longer able to make. Now, another condition that I do want to mention, because it's kind of interesting in a way, at least to me, because it was from the lab that I worked with before um, I started teaching, is there was a, there's an enzyme called 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. What this enzyme does is it will inactivate glucocorticoids in particular target tissues. This is the reason why. You produce a lot more cortisol, because remember, everything stimulates the production of cortisol, a lot more cortisol than you do mineralocorticoids. Well, who cares? What's so important about that? Well, cortisol can bind to the mineralocorticoid receptor. That mineralocorticoid receptor is not as specific as you think it should be. If you've got all these glucocorticoids around, it can bind to the mineralocorticoid receptor and cause the effects that you saw with excess mineralocorticoids. Increased sodium reabsorption, loss of potassium, high blood pressure. And so at certain target tissues, this enzyme, there's some different forms of it, will help to inactivate that glucocorticoids so you don't get excessive stimulation of the mineralocorticoid receptor. So the title of the paper, and I gave you a, um, the abstract from the paper, was that 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase in the syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess. So if a patient has a defective enzyme, that 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, they will appear as if they're overproducing mineralocorticoids because they'll have the effects of if I'm overproducing mineralocorticoids. It's an apparent mineralocorticoid excess, but their mineralocorticoid levels are fine. The problem is they've got these glucocorticoids that are producing way higher quantities than mineralocorticoids, and they're just not being inactivated. There are conditions where people are born with a deficiency in these enzymes, and the um, Perrin White is uh, the endocrinologist that I work with, and he did a lot of work on this, um, these conditions. He actually was able, in a number of different conditions, find people with high blood pressure and narrow it down to particular enzymatic defects. And so the significance of that is they were easily more easily treated because hypertension is just a symptom. If you can specifically find the cause of the hypertension, you can cure the, the, the hypertension. Well, what was interesting with this, with this one also, the reason why I want to talk to you about it, is there are certain things that you may ingest 
that can inactivate or inhibit this enzyme and lead to a syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess. Well, there was a case study where a patient came in, had high blood pressure, and they did a case history, case study, and this, this gentleman ate a lot of licorice. And we're talking the real licorice, the kind that the English people like. Not this cherry licorice, the real licorice. Licorice contains a compound that inhibits that enzyme. And this person was eating so much licorice, it was inhibiting that enzyme, causing this patient's high blood pressure. So you think, what was the treatment for this one? Lay off the licorice. Once the person stopped eating the licorice, blood pressure is fine. He was just eating way too much licorice. I couldn't tell, can't tell you exactly how much, but it was a lot. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So this is why with people with Cushing's, they get high blood pressure. They overproduce so much cortisol that this enzyme cannot inactiv inactivate all of it. You're going to have it bind binding to the mineralic corticoid receptor and causing that increased sodium reabsorption which can lead to high blood pressure.